Hello, my name is Dr. Henry Silverman, and today I'd like to give a brief presentation regarding research involving populations prone to being vulnerable. What I'll discuss in this presentation are three major aspects. One, how to define vulnerability. Two, what are the special justifications for involving vulnerable individuals in research? And once involved in research, what additional safeguards do we have to protect the rights and welfare of vulnerable subjects? First, I would like to define vulnerability. Now, multiple definitions and different conceptual frameworks of vulnerability exist because several different distinct groups have different views on vulnerability. That's why the subject of vulnerability tends to be more complicated than what it needs to be when we discuss the research context. Now, these different groups include academic staff from different disciplines, disaster management agencies, development corporations, climate change organization, and others. The typical definition that we're familiar with includes the following the potential to suffer harm or loss related to the capacity to anticipate a hazard, cope with it, resist it, and recover from its impact. Both vulnerability and its antithesis, resilience, are determined by physical, environmental, social, economic, political, cultural, and institutional factors. So in essence, this definition here describes vulnerability as having an increased risk of harms. However, that's not the complete picture in research. So how to define vulnerability in research? Well, there are two senses of vulnerability. One is liable to succumb to temptation or manipulation. The other sense is to be exposed to the possibility of being attacked or harmed either physically or emotionally. This latter part is what we are used to when we think of the word vulnerability. So let me drill down a little bit deeper here with these two senses of vulnerability. First, regarding liable to, to succumb to temptation or manipulation, what are we talking about is individuals who cannot protect themselves regarding enrolling in a research. Essentially, there are concerns with either undue inducement or exploitation that takes advantage of individuals when they are approached for enrollment. Now, once they are enrolled, they are now being exposed to the possibility of being attacked or harmed, either physically or emotionally. Again, this regards increased potential harms when one is actually in a study, and then we want to provide safeguards. Now, this first one here, I consider to be the defining aspect of vulnerability in research. Someone who are less able to protect their interests, and hence they are more liable to be enrolled. They are more liable to be unduly induced or more liable to be exposed to exploitation. Well, let me continue. First, to be vulnerable, one has to be substantially unable to protect themselves, as I said before. And second, to be vulnerable, one has to be exposed to the possibility of harm. So it's actually a two-part definition. Both elements are necessary. So here we have a definition. To be vulnerable means to, be, to substantially lack the ability and means to protect them oneself and be exposed to the possibility of harm. The two significant words in this previous definition is to be substantially lack the ability and to be exposed to the possibility of harm. I'll get back to this definition again later in this presentation. So how to define? Well, the CIAMS guidelines, an international guideline, states the following. Vulnerable persons are those who are relatively or absolutely incapable of protecting their own interests 
More formally, they may have insufficient power, intelligence, education, resources, strength, or other needed attributes to protect their own interests. So reasons for vulnerability in the context of research, there may be intrinsic and situational reasons to account for subjects unable to protect themselves. Intrinsic, we're talking about the lack of decision-making capacity. Situational, we're talking about political, social, economic circumstances that make subjects vulnerable to exploitation or undue inducement. So we have intrinsic, and then we have situational or external aspects. So let me give you specific examples regarding the internal aspect, decision-making uh, incapacity, either due to cognitive vulnerability or communicative vulnerability. Economic means, means that certain individuals may be exposed to undue inducements. Regarding decision-making capacity, if one lacks decision-making capacity, they are more liable to succumb to exploitation. Dependent relationships, which consist of informal social constructive power imbalances. And examples include patients and physicians, parents and children, students and employees, and citizens and government. Um, also lack of freedom, which involve prisoners, military communities and developing and developed countries as well. Now, let me explain what we mean by medical vulnerability. Medical vulnerability, does that mean you're more prone to physical harms? It really means that one has a strong desire or need for a particular drug or intervention. For example, oncology patients who have exhausted their options of standard chemotherapy and are now being asked to join an experimental study. Again, this definition of medical vulnerability addresses the first part of vulnerability, which is unable to protect their own interests. And in this case, the overwhelming desire or need for a particular drug or intervention makes them more likely to enroll in the study. Medical vulnerability, again, doesn't have anything to do with increased risk of harm once in the study. We are mainly concerned with people more liable to succumb to undue inducement or exploitation. Now, social vulnerability is also a misunderstood concept, particularly in the research concept. Now, the usual concept of social vulnerability is that follows. A number of social factors, including poverty, lack of access to transportation, and crowded housing may weaken a community's ability to prevent human suffering and financial loss in the event of disaster. And this is why we have various indices of social vulnerability to measure the increased risk of a social group to various harms. However, in the research context, I maintain that social vulnerability occurs when participants are at risk of discrimination or exploitation based on race, gender, ethnicity, age, and social status. Essentially, these marginalized groups are more likely to, to be taken for granted when approached for enrollment in studies. So again, this relates to that first part of the definition of vulnerability, unable to protect themselves. Now, the other concept I wanna talk about is vulnerability too broad of a concept. I show this slide because this, when I used to submit my research protocols to my IRB, they would ask this question. Will you be recruiting any of the following vulnerable population? S select all that apply. And if you look at this slide here, we see, all these different groups. And the question is, who's left out? You, you're bound to check off uh, one of these groups in your research study. So it just seems like that uh, my IRB used to want to capture almost everybody involved in research. 
Here are examples from international guidelines for research ethics, and we see definitions or types of vulnerability from the Belmont Report, the U.S. Regulations, uh, Declaration of Helsinki, and the CIOMS guidelines as well. So how broad a concept? Well, we, we don't want to include everybody in the world as being vulnerable. I mean, for sure, all human beings substantially lack the ability to protect themselves, but not to the same degree. So I like to emphasize in this previous definition of vulnerability, to be vulnerable means to substantially lack the ability means to protect them oneself and be exposed to a significant probability of, of incurring an identifiable harm. So uh, there are different degrees of vulnerability and we're concerned with those who substantially lack the ability or means to protect their interests. So what about special protections for vulnerable populations? Well, first I wanna talk about the concept of special justification. I showed you th this paragraph on the CIMS guidelines. Here, the other part of this guideline says, special justification is required for inviting vulnerable subjects who lack the means of protecting the rights and welfare. So what kind of justification do we need when enrolling vulnerable individuals? For example, well, the study cannot be performed equally well involving a less vulnerable group, for example, adults, um, or the research is intended to obtain knowledge that will improve the diagnosis, prevention, or treatment of diseases or other health problems characteristic of the vulnerable class. So for example, if we have a drug for hypertension, we don't go to the institutions and enroll mentally impaired patients to show the effectiveness of an antihypertensive drug, we could involve a group that's less vulnerable. For example, individuals who are capable of giving their own informed consent. Now regarding the second point, if we wanted to treat a specific mental illness, then for sure, we would need to include those vulnerable subjects. What about additional protections for vulnerable individuals? Special protections during the process of enrolling such individuals, so we're not exploiting them. And then additional protections against the potential harms in the research study once they get in, into the study. U.S. regulation says, when some or all of the subjects are likely to be vulnerable to coercion or undue influence, such as these individuals, additional safeguards have been included in the study to protect the rights and welfare of the subjects. So what are the types of harms that could occur in research? One, well, invalid consent during the process of enrolling, either, again, through undue inducement or exploitation. And then once in the research, there may be an unfavorable risk-benefit ratio for the subjects. There may be breach of confidentiality or privacy, which exposes the individual to social harms. Or there may be a lack of access to the benefits of research. So what do I mean by specific, well, what kind of protections are we talking about? Well, to avoid an invalid consent, we could um, obtain surrogate consent, or we could assess understanding of the individual to make sure they really understand the study. Unfavorable risk benefit ratio, well, we may wanna have a limitations on risk. Breach of confidentiality or privacy, we would include stronger confidentiality protections to prevent stigma or other social harms. And then regarding lack of access to the benefits of research, uh, well, we wanna make sure first that the study is responsive to the health needs of those included in the study. And, and we wanna make sure that drugs are available to that social population. Regarding consent 
requirements for research involving individuals who cannot decide for themselves requires surrogate consent. And we're mainly talking about children, the mentally impaired, and those individuals who are temporarily having cognitive deficits, for example, trauma patients when they get admitted to the emergency room. And then additional safeguards include limit on the level of risk. So for vulnerable subjects, should it be no more than minimal risk? And then the other thing to prevent undue inducement, we could limit payment incentives. So I hope this short presentation was helpful in trying to demystify the concept of vulnerability regarding individuals in the research context. Thank you very much.